aquestes jornades organitzades també per iniciativa, ja en vam parlar quasi bé farà un any, amb la regidura de Memòria Democràtica de l'Ajuntament de Barcelona i jo com a director de l'Observatori, amb tots els projectes que compartim amb el Consistori, vam organitzar aquestes jornades que en diem Colom, Nialismes, Patrimoni i Memòria Colonial a la ciutat de la Barcelona d'avui. Unes jornades que també comptant amb la col·laboració i compten amb la col·laboració de tot l'equip, des d'aquí saludo la Montse Iniesta, que no ha pogut estar amb nosaltres, del Born de Centre Cultura i Memòria de Barcelona, però ja sabeu que per causa de la pandèmia al final les hem hagut de fer totalment online i sobretot els ponents, no només els ponents, sinó també els participants i assistents, sapigueu que podeu seguir-les per Zoom i s'emetran per un canal de YouTube que podeu triar les dues versions, versió original o versió en anglès. Podreu triar des del canal. Des de l'Observatori Europeu de Memòries de la Fundació Solidaritat de la Universitat de Barcelona, que estem treballant transnacionalment sobre els conflictes i els dilemes i les vicissituds de les polítiques públiques de memòria, però també ens activem a través de tota Europa, i no només Europa, també amb Llatinoamèrica i altres països del món, per crear projectes, per interpel·lar a la memòria els nostres espais públics i, com no, sempre tenim un ull a casa i sempre tenim una part del nostre treball que mirem cap a dintre, mirem què fem aquí a la ciutat de Barcelona, i no només a la ciutat de Barcelona, tant perquè estem en la universitat com que la nostra col·laboració amb l'Ajuntament. D'alguna manera, la ciutat on nosaltres, la majoria de nosaltres, o molts de nosaltres, hi vivim, compartim i vivim aquests conflictes amb el nostre passat, amb l'espai públic, que és, diguéssim, l'àgora de discussió i des de realment on nosaltres vivim les nostres crisis, els nostres conflictes, però també on vivim els nostres valors, les nostres llibertats i on ens socialitzem. El debat sobre aquesta herència de colonialisme i d'esclavisme és una discussió que, a més a més, ha pres força aquest any de pandèmia i de confinaments, però ha pres molta força també, en guany, aquest estiu, però també va a Barcelona a la ciutat des de ja fa anys. Sabeu que el consistori, aquest mateix consistori, va retirar l'estàtua d'Antonio López López i això també portava tot un procés de participació social, no només acadèmic, a darrere, i també una miqueta de deute de la ciutat envers un passat que no està gaire clar. I d'un passat que no ens hauríem de sentir des dels valors del present massa, massa orgullosos. Però no només això, ja sabeu que als Estats Units, molts fòrums mundials i molts fòrums europeus, el paper d'aquests moviments socials, les protestes, com he dit, sobretot també aquest any, que les hem vist com més que mai, posen aquests conflictes sobre la taula i també jo penso, després el Jordi Rabassa, el regidor, ens ho confirmarà o no, també a l'agenda pública de les administracions, que d'alguna manera els han d'acompanyar, no només gestionar, sinó també acompanyar. A nivell més de transnacional, volia fer un parell d'observacions abans d'acabar. Ja fa temps que alguns dels intel·lectuals, professors i acadèmics, el mateix Michael Rothberg, que parlava que aquest passat colonial també a Europa, no?, ha contribuït a crear aquesta espècie d'idea d'europeïtat, d'europeïtat. Jo diria alguna vegada d'una espècie d'eurocentrisme, fins i tot, i que se'n parlarà molt aquests tres dies de col·loqui, i que fins i tot això pot derivar, segons quines actituds, encara avui en dia, per desgràcia, doncs xenòfobes i racistes en contra de col·lectius, sobretot, col·lectius de nouvinguts i d'emigrants. Jo no sé si les polítiques de memòria, i això ho debatrem aquests dies, amb els grans experts i ponents que també saludo i vull agrair molt la seva participació de tot el món, doncs si aquestes polítiques de memòria que es poden impulsar des de l'acadèmia, universitats públiques, però també des de les institucions, doncs poden o no, fins a quin punt, són preventives, són profilàctiques o poden fer front a aquests problemes actuals, no? El problema actual, que a més a més està a l'ordre del dia, com ja sabeu, que per sort o per desgràcia dona un percentatge creixent de partits 
que estan als nostres parlaments, a les nostres institucions d'extrema dreta, que a vegades també ho fomenten, i aquests discursos i aquests relats. D'alguna manera, conjuntament, l'Observatori i amb l'Ajuntament entomem aquest repte a través d'aquestes jornades on discutirem tot aquest passat colonial de la ciutat i les implicacions, molt important, aquest passat, les implicacions en el present. Per això parlem de polítiques de memòria i també parlarem, no només sortirà el paper de simbòlic d'aquesta estàtua de López López que ja es va retirar, però sinó també de l'altre gran dilema que va ser el monument a Colom i que d'alguna manera nosaltres hem volgut jugar amb aquest joc fàcil de paraules literals que dona títol a les jornades, no aquest Colom ni a l'ISME. D'alguna manera, per no allargar-me més, perquè realment els qui tindran la paraula i seran interessants d'escoltar no som nosaltres, sinó seran els experts i els nostres convidats, doncs agrair finalment a la gent que ha participat, Jordi Rabassa, que ara li cedere la paraula, des de la regidoria de memòria. Gràcies també per la iniciativa i gràcies pel teu equip, en Carles, l'Àngel Llorenç, el Carles Vicente i la Maite Safont. I malgrat no pogués ser aquí, també agrair i fer-li una forta abraçada a la Montse, a la Montse Iniesta i tot el personal del Born. I també al meu equip i a l'equip de l'Observatori Europeu de Memòries, el Ricard, pel seu ingent treball, l'Oriol, que estarà per aquí moderant també la primera taula, i sobretot a la doctora Celeste Muñoz pel seu treball de comissió d'aquestes jornades i a la Fernanda per tot el tema logístic i de comunicació. La Sílvia també, que esteu per aquí, l'equip de Sílvia Palà, gràcies per la traducció i el vostre sempre esforç. Això d'online també, no sé si us ho dificulta o no. A vegades, els que donem classes, crec que ens ho dificulta molt, perquè a vegades veus pantalles en negre, no saps com interpretar la gent i el que està dient. I res més, i sobretot en darrer lloc, les que heu vingut i les que esteu connectades des dels altres països i que realment fareu d'aquestes jornades una gran reflexió crítica i esperem que no s'acabin aquí perquè aquest debat d'aquestes memòries incòmodes, que jo sempre escric i parlo sobre aquestes memòries incòmodes quan ens referim al colonialisme i les restes d'espais simbòlics o monuments simbòlics de l'esclavitud al nostre país i al nostre continent. Moltes gràcies, molt bona feina i Jordi Rabassa, regidor de Memòria Democràtica i Ciutat Vella, passo la paraula. Molt bé, Jordi. Doncs moltes gràcies per la per la teva introducció i també moltes gràcies per la feina de tot l'equip de l'Eurom per preparar aquestes jornades. Confiem, doncs, estem convençuts que aquestes jornades ens serviran per pensar, per, per, per pensar críticament quin és, el nostre, quin és el nostre espai públic, quin és l'art que hi ha en el nostre espai públic i quin és l'art que diu representar-nos a la gent, en aquest cas, que vivim a la ciutat de Barcelona, hagi nascut o no hagi nascut. Com bé dius, jo també soc regidor del districte de Ciutat Vella, que és un districte, és el districte central de la ciutat, és el districte on històricament han arribat totes les migracions i on més de la meitat de la població actualment no ha nascut a l'estat espanyol. Per tant, no hi ha cap mena de dubte que a l'hora de preguntar-nos per què és allò que ens representa, està clar que el panorama, el panorama social i el panorama econòmic, però sens dubte el panorama social, ha canviat d'una manera radical respecte a quan es van alçar certes estàtues, certs monuments que volien representar, que eren la representació, com ho són sempre, de qui mana, no? de qui són les classes dominants. Si la història l'escriuen els vençuts, ens preguntàvem fa uns dies qui són els vencedors, no? Qui eren els vencedors? Perdó, si la història l'escriuen els vencedors, eh, m'he confós. Si la història l'escriuen els vencedors, qui són els vençuts? Qui són els vençuts i qui són les vençudes? Qui eren els vençuts quan es va alçar l'estàtua de l'Antonio López? Qui són les vençudes avui? que, sens dubte, a la ciutat de Barcelona són unes altres, però sempre estan atravessades pel mateix, per la classe, per la classe popular, per les classes subalternes. Si Antonio López en el seu dia ja era ofensiu per bona part de la societat barcelonina, doncs segur que ara encara ho és més. 
perquè representa l'explotació, representa el racisme i representa el colonialisme, la vulneració de drets i l'imperialisme. Aleshores, ens hem de preguntar per això qui mira avui l'art públic a la ciutat de Barcelona i com desafiem també, entre tots i totes, les narratives històriques i les narratives que ens volen explicar la ciutat oficials. Com ho podem fer per desafiar aquestes narratives? Aquestes jornades segueixen el curs dels seminaris que es van fer fa entre dos i tres anys, liderades pel comissionat de programes de memòria, Enric Arvinyes, que va fer dos seminaris sobre colonialisme, precisament per debatre, per reflexionar sobre el públic i colonialisme, i que van acabar, diguem-ho així, tot i que no és ben bé cert, però queda bé dir-ho, van acabar amb treure el Jordi Riu, però van acabar amb la retirada de l'estàtua de l'Antonio López de la plaça que encara avui porta el seu nom, malauradament, i d'això també en soc responsable jo, i cadascú carrega amb les seves penes. Però, en tot cas, aquesta és una continuació d'aquests dos seminaris sobre colonialisme. I vam decidir tirar-lo endavant també, entre altres coses, després de veure tota la mobilització de les revoltes populars a Xile, en què una de les accions que es va dur a terme d'una manera més massiva era l'acció sobre les estàtues, sobre l'art públic, que van acabar pintades, que van acabar amb pancartes, que van acabar absolutament disfressades i que la voluntat era donar-los la volta i que tinguessin un significat diferent. Per tant, Xile va ser una primera inspiració, diguem-ho així. Però després va venir tot el moviment de Black Lives Matter i aquí tota la intervenció també en les estàtues racistes i colonials i imperialistes. Què és el que volien representar en el seu dia i què és el que representen avui? A qui representaven? Quina era la Barcelona? Quina era la imatge de Barcelona que volien donar quan una estàtua sempre és, amb el seu pedestal i amb la seva forma i amb la seva grandiositat, doncs sempre és un mecanisme del poder, no? Aquest mecanisme del poder i aquest mecanisme controlador sobre l'espai públic realment volem que segueixi sent d'aquesta manera. Per tant, durant aquests tres dies de Batreu sobre el paper de l'art públic en una ciutat que també va ser metròpoli colonial i que durant molts anys el fet de ser metròpoli colonial era venut com un pedigrí de la ciutat, que la ciutat se situava entre les ciutats importants a escala europea o potser mundial. Després, més endavant, es va intentar ocultar o es va intentar posar sota l'estora aquest passat colonial que molestava, però que avui en dia ens sembla que és important tornar-lo a posar sobre la palestra perquè només mirant el passat i mirem mirant qui hem sigut podrem construir una ciutat plenament democràtica. L'art públic com a tal és propietat de tots els ciutadans i les ciutadanes i que l'art públic estigui en un lloc determinat no vol dir que s'hi hagi de quedar per tota la vida. Però també és cert que no ens plantegem aquestes jornades com unes jornades d'estàtua sí i estàtua no. Entremig de l'opció més radical de retirada d'una estàtua hi ha la resignificació, possible resignificació, tot i que a mi em sembla pràcticament impossible, però hi ha diverses intervencions que es poden dur a terme en les estàtues per explicar-les, per contextualitzar-les, per treure i aquells aspectes menys, més antidemocràtics, l'espai públic ha de ser democràtic, l'espai públic ha de representar tothom i tothom ha de sentir-se còmode en l'espai públic. I per a poder-ho fer en una ciutat que ha sigut colonial, en una ciutat on l'espai públic, on en totes les ciutats sempre ha representat el poder, necessitem pensar-hi. No tot l'art públic barceloní, evidentment, representa el colonialisme ni representa l'imperialisme, però hi ha una part que sí, i sobre aquesta part com a consistori penso i pensem des de la regidoria que és molt important fer-ho front i com a mínim reflexionar, pensar-hi críticament, 
i veure també què s'està fent en altres ciutats i què s'està pensant sobre l'art públic barceloní també fora de Barcelona. I d'aquí també el meu agraïment a totes les persones ponents i també persones que seguireu aquestes jornades. Per part meva, res més que gaudim tots plegats de les jornades. Gràcies a l'organització, gràcies a Born Centre de Cultura i Memòria, gràcies a Eurom i considerem que segur que aquestes no seran les darreres jornades o els darrers seminaris en els que parlarem del públic i colonialisme. Segur que en vindran més perquè el tema ve que s'ho val. Gaudiu, disfruteu i que l'esperit crític ens il·lumini també una mica a l'hora de tirar endavant polítiques públiques, perquè pensar-ho i debatre teòricament té la seva complexitat, però després aquestes teories, baixar-les a la política pública, de vegades es mescla amb allò tan incòmode que és la gestió i la... i bé, bàsicament la la gestió i la política de partits que a vegades ho embruta tot. Però pensem que l'anàlisi crítica l'hem de fer i el pensament l'hem de tenir per després veure de quina manera ho podem aterrar. I sense més, doncs endavant, que vagin molt bé les jornades i que gaudiu molt. Gràcies, Jordi. Donem pas sense més dilació a l'Oriol López. Hola, bona tarda a totes i a tots. Aquesta sessió serà en anglès, per tant, convido a les assistents que vulguin o que requereixin de traducció simultània que la icona que apareix a sota de tot, que és una icona d'un globus terraqui, doncs la poden activar per rebre la traducció simultània en català o castellà. Bé, We'll give a start to this first panel discussion of this uh, heritage and colonial memory in today's Barcelona conference. Uh, thank you to the Barcelona City Council to make this conference possible. Thank you also to our colleagues from Melbourne and Jerome, Fernanda, Ricard, Ansel. And last but not least, Thank you, of course, to the four speakers of this panel discussion. It is a real honor to have all of you with us and thank you for your time and to share with us all your knowledge. Um, well, uh, as you probably know, the link between the city of Barcelona and the slave trade was largely unknown until recently. But the truth is that in the 19th century, the, um, the city received a huge amount of incomes coming from those um, fortunes made by businessmen in the Spanish colonies in the Caribbean, basically. In that time, in the, in the 18th century, um, Spain held a large colonial empire. And these uh, properties were, um, let's say, um, exploded by enslaved people. So the money made in, in the colonies um, in the in the next uh, century, in the 19th century, was um, invested mainly in the city of Barcelona within the Iberian Peninsula. And these, of course, brought consequences that uh, still today are a clear um, evidence on the streets where we can find monuments, street names, or even buildings linked to that um, uncomfortable past, if you want, or awkward past. Well, but this is the case of Barcelona, but today in this first panel discussion, as I was telling you, um, we want to open the scope, to broaden a bit the scope, and to learn from those uh, international perspectives that our speakers can, can shed light on. So we will start with um, Anna Milosevic. Hi, Anna. Anna is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Leuven in Belgium and a specialist in memorialization processes. So today, Anna, you will shed light again on, on, the, um, on the experiences that you've been doing research. Please, Anna, the floor is yours. You have 15 minutes. Okay, thank you. I hope that the interpreters also can hear me well because I don't have my headphones. I'm so sorry about that because I'm currently in Italy in, uh, in Airbnb. So I do not have access uh, to headphones. 
Uh, first of all, I would like to say uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to speak about this uh, very, very important topic that lies really uh, within my heart. And this is a topic that I have been also exploring with my students in, in Leuven, where I teach a um, course on memory politics. Um, as a first speaker, um, well, my topic actually for today would be uh, to explore some kind of uh, corrective measures when it comes to memorialization um, and the link uh, with uh, colonialism in urban space. But this is quite a, you know, ungrateful task because <laughs> first I have to start actually with providing some kind of answers to uh, the issue that is uh, at the hand. Uh, but before I do that, um, I would actually like to uh, say a few words about the issue itself, about memorialization of colonialism uh, in urban space. Uh, I would uh, like to explore also why this is an issue, so why we are talking today about this and not maybe 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. And then I would like to maybe offer some kind of ideas on what are the possible corrective measures. So um, what is the issue actually um, at the hand? The issue at the hand is actually that um, we have in the last uh, 30 years discovered that there is this huge and massive underrepresentation of uh, minorities in public space in terms of monuments, public uh, commemoration, uh, memorialization in general. And this underrepresentation of minorities is not only um, about ethnic minorities or racial minorities, but also underrepresentation of maybe uh, sexual or religious minorities that live in a country. The issue at the hand is also that for many, many years with the nation states in Europe, we have had this top down politics of memory that hasn't been actually challenged by no one whereby we had narratives that were imposed um, uh, to, the, to the communities. And what we have seen in the last 20 years is this sort of democratization uh, of memory. So what this democratization of memory actually entails, it entails among other things to add some kind of new layers of knowledge uh, um, about the past experiences. Uh, about our histories, about the way we have lived um, uh, our past, but it also entails some kind of critical assessment of uh, our histories or the ways in which we remember the events. And often these rem uh, events were for many, many years um, uh, were remembered only uh, from one certain uh, point of view. So this democratization of memory, as I said, would actually entail some kind of critical thinking and critical examination of the past, as the two uh, first speakers um, uh, actually um, explained. So why we have to critically examine the past? I'm going step by step now. So why we should critically examine the past? Why we need this democratization of memory? Is it just a question of identitarian politics or there are maybe some other motives? So first of all, by critically examining the past, we can not only add these kind of new knowledges, new layers of knowledge uh, uh, to the history, but we can actually maybe try to provide some sort of acknowledgement, justice for the victims, for the communities um, uh, that were uh, part of those histories, but maybe are not included in, in official uh, memory uh, politics. So what actually is happening with the process of democratization of memory is that we um, have this kind of a clash between what is the official politics of memory and what are these new knowledges of the past that we actually haven't been aware of. So the problem, the main issue, I think, lies in the, the, the ways in which the official politics of memory has uh, been contested and by whom is contested. Um, of course, if we talk about colonialism, uh, we can see that in a number of cities, in a number of countries in Europe or around the world, um, many um, uh, memory activists are actually trying to um, start a number of initiatives, they are doing a number of activities, that they are trying to raise awareness um, on these, um, these issues, on past injustices, 
uh, et cetera, et cetera. But we have also seen a number of diaspora organizations, such as, for instance, diaspora organizations in Belgium, which is a colonial power, um, that have been quite active um, and, and uh, quite imaginative um, in providing um, a number of activities with the name to raise awareness uh, of the um, crimes uh, that were committed um, in Congo and in Africa under uh, the, the Belgian colonial um, um, power. Um, of course, uh, what kind of contestation we have? What kind of contestation we have when we talk about monuments? What kind of contestation we have when we talk about museums and renaming of the streets? Well, there are a number of cases uh, all around the world that actually uh, suggest that the contestation can be peaceful. As I said, uh, when uh, maybe um, a non-governmental organization or social, um, social actors promote these kind of activities with an aim to raise awareness, add new layers of knowledge um, uh, to, um, to the, to the to the uh, actual politics of memory, we can talk about peaceful uh, contestation because the aim is not only to raise awareness but also to provide some sort of uh, educational tool for the for the global public that maybe is not aware uh, of the issue at the hand. But we have seen also in a number of cases that uh, contestation can be also uh, violent. For instance, in South Africa, uh, a number of monuments uh, that are uh, built to roads uh, are violently contested uh, by the, 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 the broader public, by the students, uh, by a number of uh, organizations that deal with colonial history of South Africa. For instance, there is in, a, in Cape Town, there is a huge mausoleum of roads that overlooks the entire Cape. And there is this huge, huge, huge statue of roads that um, a number of protesters were trying to um, sever his head or uh, they cut his nose. Um, some of them have defecated also um, at, at the place of the monument. I have seen that with my eyes. So there is a number of ways in which people actually contest these monuments, um, but uh, also uh, they can organize uh, as groups or like-minded individuals, not necessarily that come from diaspora organizations or civil society, but as ordinary citizens, they can gather and they can reunite um, around um, of some kind of uh, idea or some kind of a project like renaming of the street or the contextualizing a certain monument. So in this case, we have an organized and a kind of a lawful um, in a certain sense uh, contestation because the actors that are involved in the contestation process, they try to, to, um, to uh, provide actually a solution on an idea and a concrete objective on how this monument or statue or street can be renamed, reused, removed from, from the public space. So this brings me actually to the um, corrective measures that I can uh, maybe classify, classify as uh, um, examples of positive action and maybe examples of negative action. So I will start maybe with the negative action. So I think that the most, most drastic way of dealing with um, uh, contested monuments is actually to remove them from the public space. So I think this is a quite controversial idea, uh, but I hope that you will also have questions about it. Um, I think it's a quite controversial idea that, you know, like monuments that in some way offend people um, should be removed from the public space. I think they should not. Uh, I think that we should, uh, they, there are ways that we can get creative and use those monuments actually to uh, learn uh, from the past and find ways to decontextualize de de um, actually what has been uh, for many, many years, the, the official narrative of that place or monument or, or that, that person. So removal uh, is an example of um, negative action for me, but also uh, there are other um, examples of negative action. For instance, um, vandalizing a monument, destroying a monument, 
uh, hidden the monument uh, from the uh, from the public space. In terms of positive action, I think that in a number of cases, um, in a number of countries that have dealt with um, authoritarian regimes or have dealt um, with totalitarian regimes, we can see people and institutions, uh, but also the states themselves, um, inducing a number of actions that try to um, deal with the past and deal with uh, what are the remnants of that old politics of memory. So if you think back maybe of countries in Central Eastern Europe, we have seen that many of them have renamed and constantly maybe renamed um, their streets, their squares, um, they have um, induced a number of laws as well uh, to deal legally with the past and to legally deal uh, with monuments. So if we think about maybe Ukraine, Ukraine has passed a law uh, that actually removes Soviet era monuments. This is one, uh, one of the examples. But countries uh, that were once colonial powers like Belgium, for instance, they have only recently discovered um, ways or they are exploring, let's say, ways to deal uh, with that past. So in terms of how Belgium maybe is dealing with the past, because this is the country where I come from, where I live actually and work, um, I think that the most uh, intriguing um, examples were maybe uh, the statue of Leopold II. And the second example is, of course, the African Royal Museum um, in, um, in Brussels. So in terms of uh, museum, let's start with the museum. For many, many years, that museum was heavily criticized by researchers, by people who visited uh, the museum because um, the way that the permanent collection was presented without critically uh, engaging with the questions of Belgian responsibility for the crimes uh, committed um, in Congo. And secondly, also uh, a number of uh, researchers uh, have also raised question about the provenience uh, of the artifacts uh, that are uh, in the museum. And these artifacts were mainly imported or brought uh, directly from Congo uh, by individuals that have lived there. But these artifacts um, raise really important question about uh, who about ownership actually um, uh, of the museum or these, uh, these uh, artifacts. So uh, Belgium a couple of years ago uh, decided to close the museum and critically engage uh, with its narrative, the narrative of the museum, because uh, most importantly, a uh, couple of years ago uh, in the old, let's say museum, uh, you would go to the museum and the entrance of the museum there was a huge statue uh, of a European explorer with a black child and with a huge writing, Belgium brings civilization to Congo. So as you can imagine, this was quite offensive for a number of people. So in a new renewed museum that actually claims to be decolonized, uh, the statue has been moved from the entrance into a hole that actually, into a, a let's say a part of the building that tries to critically engage with these questions and they try to decontextualize a bit the statue and explain the issues behind it, um, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, when I bring my students to the Mu African Museum um, in Tervuren, uh, we actually have a really nice talk about whether they think that this museum is actually decolonized and in why, what ways. Uh, some of them, uh, my students are many Belgian students, some of them actually uh, use my course to visit the museum for the first time in their lives, although they live in Belgium, and they have uh, no um, deep knowledge about the Belgian colonial history. So they are really active in engaging with these questions and exploring the, exploring the topic, and I'm really happy to discuss this with them. So uh, at the end of the semester, um, actually we discuss uh, whether this museum has left some kind of a new knowledge um, uh, 
has, has given them some kind of a new knowledge about their own national history. And the answer is quite uh, positive, I might say. Uh, although me as a researcher, I still think that the museum doesn't, in a, in a, in a clear manner, um, uh, engage critically uh, with Belgian uh, colonial history, my students think that this is already a, a positive step and it provides them some kind of a new knowledge they never have uh, thought about. The second example I mentioned in Belgium is the one of the uh, statue of Leopold II that is actively contested, and I would say every day, uh, in a number of ways. <laughs> people throw paint on the, on the statue, uh, people write petitions, so they in a legal, uh, lawful way, they are trying to contest the memorial, the monument, and actually they are asking the removal of the statue um, from, the, from the public public space. So this is most important statue of the Leopold, Leopold II, but there are a number of other statues of people who are active in uh, exp uh, exploration uh, of Congo and exploitation uh, of Congo um, in Brussels or in Belgium in general. So for instance, um, you know, like the Belgian government just recently formed a commission to critically engage with the question of colonialism, and especially in the public space. But it still uh, surprises me <laughs> a lot that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Belgium is actually in the street that bears name Rue de Colonie. <laughs> the street of colonies. So, uh, as you can uh, as you can imagine, this is a this is a this was a quite a shock for me. Uh, but people actually um, do not critically engage with the past if they if they do not see that there is a public demand uh, for critically engaging with the past and re-examining uh, the past, at least in Belgium. Um, what are the possible solutions, as I said, in terms Anna. of positive measures? Yeah, I'm finishing, yes. Yeah, Thank have you. two more minutes. In, in terms of positive me measures, as I say, as I said, uh, we can think about decontextualizing by adding this kind of new uh, knowledge or new ideas or explanations to the, to, the, uh, to the monument or the museum itself. For instance, um, uh, I gave a course to the mayors of uh, mid-Norway, last year, they are dealing with uh, an important issue because they discovered that the place of their most important and most sacred place in their national history, there is a monument made by the Nazis. So they were uh, already preparing uh, the commemoration for 1000 years since the event. And they were actually uh, asking me for ideas how to deal with this uh, Nazi monument that is really close by. So. Of course, um, there are no uh, global solutions. There are no copy paste models as we can we have seen in United States that every monument deserves its, uh, its own um, uh, special attention and every monument and every statue and every street name that causes concern that is a matter of uh, contestation should be um, addressed in direct contact with the authorities and in direct contact with the local population, um, especially not only with, with uh, civil society, civil society actors. So I think that one of the first ways, one of the most important ways actually to engage critically with the past is actually to uh, uh, engage in consultations with the people that are in direct contact with monuments, statues, um, and museums uh, in their close uh, neighborhood. So I, I think I will stop there. Okay, Anna. Thank you. Thank you to share for sharing uh, your knowledge and your experience as a researcher and also as a teacher or professor um, with us. So um, now we will pass to uh, Miguel Cardina. Uh, Miguel is a researcher at the Center of Social Studies. He's the coordinator of a research project called Crossed Memories, Politics of Silence, the Liberation Wars, the Liberation Colonial Wars in Postcolonial Times. And Miguel will, mm, will address the case of the Portuguese uh, colonialism memories. Uh, Miguel, mm, the floor is yours. Thank you. you. Well, I do not have the the video. 
Maybe the host can help you to put yes. the video on. Fernanda, please. Uh, sorry, I cannot help. Uh, Miguel, you have to find the microphone um, icon on your... Yes, yes, yes. And, and open it and then you, on, on this side, um, the other side you have the video, start video yes, button. Yes. So you, you click here and uh, we will okay. be able to yeah. see. Okay. Yes, but it, okay. it's not possible because... I cannot open it for okay. you. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, I will speak. Um, well, thank you very much for the for the invitation. Uh, um, I'm very happy to to participate in this uh, in this moment. Um, I will speak about the the Portuguese case, particularly uh, the 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 debate, the current debate about the colonial past uh, in Portugal. Um, hoping that uh, it will contribute to a comparative dialogue with uh, other contexts. In recent years, we are facing a re-emergence of the debate about colonial representations in Europe. This is not unprecedented, but it has taken now a new relevance. Colonial nostalgia that has prevailed in former European metropolis has now been simultaneously challenged and maintained uh, in the current discussions on slavery, racism, and empire. In fact, some of its visible expressions are centered uh, on formal apologies regarding the colonial violence, the debate about museums and restitutions, the contestation of stat statues and monuments in the public space, and so on. At the same time, this critical wave has also made evident the material and symbolic prevalence of colonialism in post-colonial societies. I would like to start uh, this presentation by evoking a particular monument in Portugal, in, uh, in Santa Cobadão. The monument, which you can see on the screen, is entitled Monument to the Heroes of the Overseas, Monumento aos Heróis do Ultramar, and was inaugurated in 2010 in the town of Santa Combadão. It recalls directly those young local combatants who were killed in the colonial war. The conflict, as you may know, occurred between 1961 and 1974 and led close to 800,000 young Portuguese to fight in Angola, Mozambique and Guinea. About 500,000 Africans were also integrated into the same Portuguese troops to fight the liberation movements. The war would end with the birth of five new nations in Africa, Angola, Mozambique, Guinea-Bissau, Guinea -Bissau, Santo Tomé, Prince and Cabo Verde. A regime change in Portugal uh, after, during and after the Carnation Revolution and the return mainly from Angola and Mozambique, of around 500,000 Portuguese citizens. As you can see, the monument is divided into seven vertices, each one corresponding to an old colonial territory. At the center, there is a verse of Luís Vaz de Camões from the epic poem The Lusíades, Os Lusíadas, e aqueles que por obras valorosas se vão da lei da morte libertando, something like and those who by valorous deeds free themselves from the law of death. So we have here, in, in that particular moment, monument, uh, the, the simultaneous uh, presence of a celebratory and painful memory of the empire. It is part of the recent and very prolific process of monumentalization of the colonial war in the country. In fact, uh, within Chrome Project, and that I'm now coordinating here at, at the Center for Social Studies in the University of Coimbra, uh, there is a PhD thesis going on by André Caiado, and the provisional figures of, that, the, the, of this new wave of monumentalization are really, really impressive. Throughout the country, around 300 
monuments were built in the last 10, 15 years. Returning to this particular monument, there is another interesting element worth to mention. Santa Combadão is the birthplace of Salazar, the dictator who ruled Portugal for much of the, the 20th century, and the square where the monument to the Euros of the Overseas is located, pre previously had in the same exact spot a statue of Salazar, which in 1975 would be damaged and later removed. So Celeste, could you, could you click please? because there is an image of the of the statue the statue of salazar and that is the statue uh, was uh, damaged in uh, during the carnation revolution and it was located in the same exact exact spot the two monuments are very different and made it in, in made in distinct historical contexts but I think that putting both in parallel allows us to illustrate one of the dominant features of the memory of the 20th century in the democratic Portugal. Putting it briefly, if Portuguese democracy was distanced itself from the memory of dictatorship and Salazarism, nothing similar occurred regarding the memory of the colonial past. In Portugal, as with other former European colonial powers, the memory and the oblivion of colonialism comes in multiple, in multiple and not always evident ways. In the country, the pervasive presence of the so-called lusotropicalism still exists today. The notion of lusotropicalism was created by the Brazilian intellectual Gilberto Freire and was appropriated and politically explored by the Estado Novo in a particular historical context, I, I can talk about that later, in the 50s, to portray Portug Portuguese colonialism as more benign and less aggressive than other colonialisms, uh, Spanish colonialism, Dutch colonialism, British or French colonialism. Nowadays, the presence of a colonial imaginary influenced by this picture strongly defines the dominant national ontology. The evocation of the imperial history occurs mainly through the code word discoveries, descobertas, or descobrimentos. The term refers directly to maritime exploration in the 16th century, but its public uses transcend this historical circumscription. In Portugal, speaking of descobrimentos, descobertas, discoveries, is often synonymous of a generic epic past of which the Portuguese should be proud. There are many examples of this that I could list here. For instance, the Expo 98 in Lisbon, uh, thematic parks, Portugal dos Pequenitos in Coimbra, or the, the, uh, a new thematic park uh, that was uh, inaugurated in 2014 in Porto, World of Discoveries, memorial complexes in the cities, such as Belém in Lisbon, and discursive mobilization of the imperial, imperial past in politics, in sports, in tourism, in advertising. If colonialism disappeared as a political reality, it still persists as an operative representation, weaving a bond between nation and empire that continually reproduces itself in the national memoryscape. I would like to note that the term memoryscape has been widely used in memory studies, uh, mainly as a synonym for the mnemonic place uh, occupied by museums, squares, statues, and other material objects. Nevertheless, I think that in order to understand the memoryscape processes of implementation, legitimization, and naturalization, we should have in mind a broader perspective, which does not merely focus on materializations of memory in concrete uh, physical spaces, but also in an integrated analysis of the materiality, politics, and social imaginary involved in its composition, in the composition of the memoryscapes. For many reasons, never existed in Portugal a socially broad process of, ref of critical reflection on the colonial past, as, for example, uh, 
is occurring uh, currently in, uh, in, in many countries, as Anna Milosevic talked about the, the Belgian case right now. Portuguese case, it's still this this critical refraction is still uh, not on 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 ongoing. This aspect this aspect produces an apparent paradox. The stronger this imaginary is, the more it becomes invisible, precisely because it is so present that appears as naturalized. As Anne Rini wrote once in a text about monuments, and I quote, is ironically the lack of unanimity that keeps some memory sites alive. The same could be generically said about the representations of the past. And that's why mnemonic disputes has a civic and democratic role. On this particular, I would like to mention some discussions arose in Portugal from, from 2070 on. I will enumerate, enumerate some without pretending to be exhaustive. In April 2017, the president of the Republic, Marcelo Rebelo de Sousa, visited the island of Goré in Senegal, a space once used for trafficking enslaved Africans across the Atlantic. There, he highlighted the supposedly pioneering role that Portuguese authorities played in the abolition of slavery in 1761. In fact, the date does not signal the abolition of the trade of the slave trade throughout the empire, but the end of slave tra traffic to the metropolis, concentrating it instead in Brazil. The presidential statements triggered an open letter in which the signatories criticized, and I quote, the idealistic and exceptionalistic view of the colonial legacy of Portuguese history. In the same year, 2017, the placement in Lisbon of a statue of Padre Antonio Vieira, in which the Jesuit, the Jesuit priest appears wielding a cross and with indigenous children at his feet would fuel various gestures of contestation, the most recent of which was in July, in June this year, uh, in, the, in, the, in the context, in fact, on the context of, of big anti-racist demonstrations after the, the, the assassination of George Floyd, and also in Portugal, in Lisbon, that there was, there was a, a big demonstration, anti-racist demonstration, and in that day, uh, the, the statue of uh, Padre Antonio Vieira uh, was, um, was uh, some anonymous hands wrote the word decolonize on the statue and drew small red arts on the three children motivating a lively debate. There is a photo on that in the screen. Similarly, Back in 2017, one of the proposals submitted and selected for the participatory budget of Lisbon came from JAS, an association of Afro-descendants, and advocates the creation of a memorial of homage to enslaved people. The winning project was presented by the Angolan artist Kiluan Jikiaenda, and it is now in the implementation phase. However, the proposal to create a museum of the discovery in the city, the city of Lisbon, which appeared shortly afterward, afterwards, was the one that was more debated. The idea had been launched by the winning socialist candidacy for the local municipality within the framework of, of a, a tourist growth in the country's capital. The de designation of a Museum of the Discovery, Museu da Descoberta, and not discoveries, descobertas or, or descobrimentos, trying a somehow obscure resignification, has been contested by some sectors of uh, academia and civil society. As said in a collective open letter, did the African, Asian, and American peoples with millenary histories feel discovered by the Portuguese? And how will the populations from these territories feel today when visiting a museum space 
that deprives their ancestors of historical initiative, reducing their role to objects to be discovered, often violently, by the Portuguese." End quote. However, a considerable number of opinion articles on the topic in the press reaffirmed the place of, of overseas expansion in the national identity, censoring the existence of supposed penitential narratives in some engaged sectors of public opinion, in the public opinion. From my point of view, this is explained by the persistence of what I defined in a, in a text about nations' representations in the Cavaco Silva uh, presidential speeches as an amnesic memory. I mean, narratives, narrative forms of framing the past that actively produce selective images. In this specific case, these evocations are expressed through a double mechanism of revelation and concealment. On the one hand, the narratives associated with the singularity of the Portuguese expansion are valued. On the other hand, its discursive concretization uh, operates semantic re reconfigurations through which the violent dimension of colonialism and the traumatic way in which the imperial cycle ended with a defeated war was silenced. An expression of this in Cavaco Silva's presidential speeches is present in the words he chooses to say, for instance, Portuguese language, heritage, sea, cultural encounters, Europe, but also in those that he chooses to suppress. Terms like colonialism, colonization, racism, or slavery never appear in that speeches. To conclude, colonial heritage exists beyond the statues and the museum walls. Colonial implications are still alive in celebrations, in political discourse, in public re representations of the nation, and in, in, in the effective hierarchies of citizenship. As a matter of fact, Decolonization is not exclusively a transfer of power from Europeans to former colonized territories. It is coming to terms with the disappearance of the colonial order that favored European countries, confronting imperial legacies and reflecting upon contemporary citizenship as inhabited by what Michael Rothberg in a recent book called Implicated Subjects, who have contributed to or benefit from regimes of domination. Today's Portugal is not the imperial power that went through much of this 20th century as a colonizing, though semi-peripherical, metropolis. However, still exists a sort of what I call imperiophilia that induces a significant number of representations about its identity and its history. The incessant reproduction of the same narrative has been challenged in the recent years, as I, as I uh, illustrated, although it is difficult to anticipate how this process will unfold in the future. We only know that it will have an effective role in the mnemonic, epistemological and political debates that are yet to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miguel, for this very interesting presentation. I really didn't know many of the examples that you uh, shared with us. And we will continue now with the last presentation. And then we'll have uh, some, sorry, I put the video on now, yes. Um, I was saying that uh, we will continue with the last presentation and then at the end we'll have uh, some time for, for Q&A. Um, the last presentation is, uh, will be shared uh, 
by Alexandra Hill and Celia Zayas, both of them consultants and researchers at um, the organization called Culture Solutions. Culture Solutions um, aims uh, to provide an analysis of the current state of the EU external action in terms of culture. And specifically, Alexandra and Celia are working within this organization um, to find the, the key concepts and, and, and measures that should be present for uh, decolonizing EU policy, exterior policy in, in the field of culture. So, uh, Celia, Alexandra, we are very keen to hear your presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you, Oriol. Can you hear me well? Yes. Thank you. Okay, I'm unable to open my, my video either. Um, let me try again. Well, I'll try to fix it later. So thank you all for your presentation and, and thank you to the European Observatory on Memories for the invitation. So as Oriol just said, my name is Alexandra and together with Celia, uh, we will be delivering this brief presentation on behalf of Culture Solutions, that is an independent non-for-profit social innovation group contributing to the excellence of uh, EU international cultural relations. What we will discuss here is the result of research and internal discussions by a group and does not necessarily reflect the official view of the organization. So today we will be speaking about EU external cultural action and colonization. We start from the assumption that as Roberto Rocus says, colonization is not only a common shared past, but it is also at the heart of the European Union integration itself. It is central to the past and to the current place of the European Union in the world. And the relationship between the EU and colonialism entangles for us two different viewpoints of analysis. One would be its past, how the EU deals, how the EU narrates colonial memories. And the second one would be its present, or if the EU really takes advantage of unique power relations to build dependency relations with other countries that is neo-colonial or post-colonial relations. Their main characteristic is that this is not done by coercive measures, but by indirect means, as it could be official development aid, trade agreements, security cooperation, cultural relations. So as per the relationship with colonial memories, the European Union has not released official political statements to apologize for its bloody past. And even if the institution as such did not exist when its member states' colonization experiences started taking place, it is true that some of the founding members of the European Economic Community back in 1957 were still colonial powers, and some of them still had colonial possessions when they joined years later. The European Parliament has included the topic in a number of resolutions that deal particularly with the commemoration of human rights violations that took place within the territory of the European Union. And in this sense, a number of scholars criticize the fact that EU efforts for historical remembrance have focused almost exclusively, and I read, on the Holocaust and National Socialism as well as Stalinism, which could be somehow interpreted as a sort of gesture towards Eastern European countries, especially since the enlargement of 2004 some of which, like Poland, have actually made the memorial policies a strong component of their cultural diplomacy. But, and I read again, it remains curiously quiet about the memories of imperialism and colonialism. An interesting example illustrating this statement is the recent analysis about the narratives used at the House of European History, that is a museum opened in May 2017, under the initiative of the European Parliament that we can discuss in the debate afterwards if you deem it of interest. But before moving on, we'd like to highlight very briefly one of the most recent European Parliament resolutions that brought the issue of colonialism to the table on ending racist discrimination against Afro-European people in the EU. In this resolution, members of the European Parliament suggested that the European Union and its member states should tackle the structural racism people in Africa of African descent face in Europe. But it also suggests to carry out reparations, such as apologizing publicly, returning stolen artifacts to their countries of origin, or amongst others, 
presenting a comprehensive perspective on colonialism and slavery in the educational curricula. So before I give the floor to Celia, culture is an area in which both perspectives collide, since it is through culture that we portray the past and build a common identity. And here it is worth mentioning the, the great deal of value given by the European Union to the protection of cultural heritage. But also, it is frequently framed, and particularly in the case of cultural relations, in terms of soft power as a means to persuade and construct hegemony without coercion. EU cultural relations, if considered as a means for postcolonial relations, are, however, intrinsically different from other international policies in their own nature. While in development, trade, security, or energy, the ownership of the object or the value is frequently unidirectional, which determines straight away the leverage of the partners, culture is not exclusive from the European Union. It exists everywhere, and it can even be considered as a common good for all parties. Indeed, cultural goods and services are a worldwide phenomenon. Thus, cultural relations as a means for domination would be the result of the fictional attribution of a higher value to some cultures amongst others. And this is done through the creation and modification of symbols to which the discourse is central. But which elements can characterize a discourse or a policy as neo-colonial or post-colonial? There is no clear answer for this question, but we ought to look to the who and the what. Who takes part in the decision-making process? Like, so the agency? And how is the other represented? So the messaging. I'll now continue. Thank you, Alexandra. I don't know, you can hear me well? Yes. Yes. So um, the EU messaging, find this more obvious point on the policy documents. And we will dig a little deeper into the most relevant ones, but just a quick remark. Uh, the EU external action works through a network of youth delegations. And in the case of the cultural action, also through EUNIC clusters. EUNIC is the network of European international institutes for culture. And they have increasingly spread all over the world. So EU delegations combine international cultural relations priorities an approach with country-specific thematic priorities. Are they expected to tailor the priorities of the policy document to the reality of the local cultural context? And the role of the EU delegations on this matter, as well as the EUNIC model, are actually uh, analyzed in, in the research report of Culture Solutions Composing Trust. Um, our starting point for concerning the, policy, the cultural policies is the European Agenda for Culture in a Globalizing World of 2007. Uh, it underlined that the role of culture is a tool for soft power and that the EU is and must aspire to become even more. But today, the EU external cultural action is guided by a joint communication of 2016. And before its approval, the Commission commanded a pool of experts to prepare a preparatory action in order to advance knowledge and reflection on the role of culture in external cultural relations, as well as to make for a strategy in the field. Uh, the preparatory action is called Engaging the World towards global cultural citizenship. And this initiative is very interesting because it acknowledges colonialism as the origin of long-standing and strong cultural ties between European countries and third countries. Although it also recognizes that the nature of these relations may be different. And for instance, the relations of Algerian citizens uh, may have with France may be different from the ones that they have with the rest of the EU population. It also recognizes that because of the colonial past, the EU is frequently perceived as a new colonial partner, and this hinders trust in the EU, uh, who is perceived to be pursuing its own agenda and this instrumentalizing culture. Uh, this image, while combined with a recognized dependence on funding from EU donors to carry out international cultural relations, they make that neighborhood countries and strategic partnerships countries they, and I quote, they feel uneasy with the dependency implied in the existing donor-recipient relationship. And it calls for a spirit of partnership that is filled of mutual learning and exchange and equality of position. Uh, then the participatory action, actually, it assumes a quite a strong decolonial approach, daring to talk about the elephant of the room. Um, and this participative process was the basis on which the joint communication of 2016 uh, towards a new strategy for international cultural relations was built. This document is very important because it says strategy and culture for the entire EU external action. But the question there is if 
it's built on the decolonial perspective that is brought by the preparatory action. And in short, our analysis showed that it's different from a good intention, but it could actually be improved. And although a deeper research could and shall be done, uh, there are some remarks that can be highlighted in this sense. Uh, the first is that cultural diversity is present since the very first sentence of this young communication, as we see here in the, in the quote. Um, it actually makes a significant effort in promoting intercultural dialogue, and it explicitly supports the need for establishing dialogue with local stakeholders. However, the joint communications does not make any reference to the weight of the colonial history in their relationship with the partner countries. And also, um, it frames cultural relations as a tool for promoting a global order uh, at the European side. Therefore, uh, in terms of soft power, which leaves the, the room open for instrumentalizing culture. And actually, these quotations that were, it refers to soft power, are part of the introduction of the document and not only of the party dedicated to cultural diplomacy. This is problematic because it risks that this approach is mainstream uh, to the entire scope of EU cultural relations, that, in, that is, including culture for development, intercultural dialogue for peace, and international cooperation on cultural heritage. And in this regard, the joint communication uh, we consider that it did not do a substantial follow-up on the decolonial approach of the preparatory action, nor did the latest EU strategy on culture, the new, new European Agenda of 2018, which in the part dedicated to external cultural relations, it briefly reveals on the joint communication of 2016 on similar terms. The third point then is how, how to implement, like how is the implementation of these documents? Um, the, the final and the central question then is if the EU develops its external cultural action decolonially. But what does it mean? Uh, there is no real, no, there is no guide for this. But the postcolonial theories actively call for two elements. First, to recognize one's privilege, and second, to listen. And when conceptualizing, designing, and acting, the EU needs to recognize that it is not and it cannot be a neutral actor, but it is part of our relationships. Also, it needs to avoid the colonialist move, as uh, Chandana Mohanty created the terms in 1984. That is, it needs to avoid uh, to develop a narrative of the other that puts the EU in a position in which it is legitimated to decide what is best for the other. And instead, it should just listen and give agency and involvement in all the decision making process. Another conceptual and practical resource for decolonized approaches is intercultural communication and intercultural approaches to international cooperation. And in a more practical way, it would mean to involve local actors in all stages of cultural relations, to put resources at the service of their identified needs, and to engage in a true equal to equal dialogue in which cultural goods and services are equally valued from both sides. And in this regard, the, the role of youth delegations, as outlined in the Culture Solutions Report, is absolutely essential. Because by engaging with local stakeholders and adapting the general policy frameworks to their context, they are the front runners in decolonizing the practice from the institutional culture through healthy consultations, redesigning priorities, and allocating economic resources to the needs identified by the local actors. And those are some of the key issues that can be done. So to conclude, despite attempts to decolonize European external cultural policy frameworks, we believe more advocacy, desk and field work remains to be done. In short, words are there, but deeds are still missing. There is room for an ambitious agenda that should mix historical, sociological, cultural and political approaches to address, discuss and manage European colonial memories. In our opinion, post-colonial relations lack a solid cultural dimension, and we firmly believe more cultural action would help improve those. EU international cultural relations could be a front runner for a renewed approach to foreign policy that avoids neocolonial behaviors. From a macro perspective on strategy design and policy narratives, a deeper and coordinated connection between internal and external EU policies could help addressing key issues such as migration, the role of diasporas, or post-colonialism. European citizens themselves have painful memories of intra-European conquests and invasions that left deep scars and still affect contemporary relations. And these memories 
are intertwined with intercontinental colonial memories as much as intra-African and intra-American memories of domination and internal colonization. It is also interesting to think that an integral approach to decolonization could even work as a new push to the European identity narrative and to a more inclusive EU project truly united in diversity. In third countries, such, such an approach um, would have to be embedded in country-specific EU cultural strategies combining European Union and member states' cultural priorities. Um, yes, from a more micro perspective, uh, we've seen that the EU political change of paradigm has established principles such as mutual dialogue, people to people approach, or bottom up initiatives and cooperation. Uh, that are paving the way towards a more horizontal relations with partners. The more recent global backslash of multilateralism and the sort of return to realist politics, however, has switched the discourse again towards terms such as the language of power of, or a geopolitical commission. And this is an approach that is superposing geopolitical interests onto building a fair and respectful relation. So we will see in the future if the two kind of messages that we have here in the slide are compatible or not. And actually, um, decolonizing the practice of EU external cultural action goes through reassessing the long term strategic na nature of interculturality and its potential for peaceful coexistence and mutual respect. But how to do this in practice? Well, um, recommendations in the field of EU cultural cooperation cover an array of actions that could solve misinterpretations at the Im implementation phase. Uh, some of them being common to the cooperation for development in general, such as the, the use of non-European languages or prioritizing local expertise among um, European expertise. And in this regard, EU delegations have a really key role in the short term to decolonize their, their institutional culture and functioning as the key actors in building partnerships uh, of mutual dialogue and engaging in people-to-people -people relations or acting as speakers of bottom-up initiatives. Even for them, this situation can be advantageous because since by not being perceived as imposed, they, they can benefit from a better climate of understanding that can easily expand to other areas in which EU delegations are working. This the theory is pretty clear, is accept that, EU, that the EU is not a neutral actor and listen and give voice to the less powerful. The practice needs at the first stage to decolonize the mind, as Franz Fanon would say, and this is much more difficult. But this is where arts as a tool for challenging representations and meanings is extremely powerful because um, if arts brought the colonial gaze to the European collective imagination under the pen of Lord Byron, Jules Berner, uh, Bernes, or the pens of Agostino Brunias here in the slide, um, they have also been the, the forefront of the decolonial gaze and films, books, performance, or visual arts, such as this painting of uh, Patti Schindele here in the slide, um, they have been a space for the decolonial discussion. They have been essential for rewriting the, the symbols and meanings. And in this sense, um, artistic creations gives voice and the first step for decolonizing is to, to start listening. So culture is a tool for social innovation and for social change at the end of the day. And if the EU is willing to engage in decolonizing its praxis, culture can be the perfect scenario for mutual learning, collaboration and, and co-creation. Well, thank you very much, and we're open to any any further questions. Thank you very much, Alexandra and Celia, and thank you to the four, the all four speakers that uh, started the first panel discussion today. Um, well, now we'll open the. Um, the floor to all the attendees and we can receive uh, questions and comments through the chat. Uh, while we are receiving these this, um, questions, I can start asking to each of the speakers um, some ideas that came to my mind while you were speaking. Anna, for instance, Anna Milosevic, you, you were talking about underrepresented minorities and democratization of memory. And uh, it came to my, to my mind that uh, recently, quite recently in, in New York City, uh, a new monument to uh, suffragist women, including uh, black women, uh, was opened in Central Park. And 
the question should be something like, apart from contestation to those offensive monuments, do you think that the building of new monuments like this one that I mentioned uh, can contribute to heal the, um, the past human rights uh, disasters, let's say? Micro. So uh, you're asking a quite complicated question with a very interesting example, I would say. Um, I'm not very convinced that the current use of monuments and memorialization in general is um, actually uh, contributing to healing the wounds from the past. So when I say this, I mean that, you know, in, in many, many cases, we have seen new monuments arising because of this perceived, uh, let's say, uh, public need for a new monument, for uh, you know, adding these kind of new layers of knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. But the further we go, you know, like from the event or from the person um, that actually, uh, from an event that actually happened to a present, uh, we are actually building monuments that correspond to the present. Uh, needs of societies, of uh, political groups, of individuals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, of course, this is not always the case. I'm not saying that this is the the, the general rule. In some instances, uh, you know, you you have uh, victims' families, uh, you have descendants of uh, certain groups that find quite important to actually have a monument, and this is some some sort of uh, restorative justice for these population. And it's quite beneficial, beneficial for them. But in terms of healing the wounds uh, of the past, I'm, I'm not quite convinced that it actually heals the wounds, but it certainly um, contributes to the uh, recognition, uh, acknowledgement of their past suffering. And this is, uh, I think, quite important. Mm -hmm. And is there any example in Belgium, that, which is your, your main focus of the research of a new monument in this regard? of a new monument that seeks to uh, address uh, past injustices. Well, on transnational level, uh, <laughs> this is quite important, and Alexandre and Celia also uh, talked about the House European history. Um, this is a quite evident example of a monument that seeks to provide um, this kind of uh, critical assessment uh, of the past and this kind of new European approach that seeks to pacify the tensions that actually come, come from the past. So this uh, museum was actually one of the, the instruments that the European institutions, the EU, uh, have used to induce some sort of reconciliation among European people, some sort of you know, to, uh, to create some kind of a, like a shared narrative, a common thread among different kind of histories and different kind of experiences. This is one example. But another example that also deals with transnational memory politics is the one of a monument that is, uh, well, announced and, you know, uh, kind of built uh, in, a, in a close uh, future on uh, the monument that actually seeks to commemorate all the victims of totalitarian regimes. And this monument is supposed to be placed in a small square in front of the European Parliament. And you know, this, is, this has been a quite controversial um, project and quite a controversial uh, monument that actually uh, gives this kind of a huge responsibility you know, to, a, to a monument, to a, to a statue and a construct in an urban space that you know this monument is supposed to um, kind of pacify the tensions and kind of put on the same level all the victims of all totalitarian authoritarian regimes in Europe um, and elsewhere. So this is maybe one of uh, one of the recent examples of the monuments in, in, in Brussels, but you know like Brussels is is <laughs> not only a, a house for the, the European institutions but also um, it's a capital of Belgium. So we have a different kind of uh, national and transnational monuments and monuments, the different kind of diasporic groups also construct. And uh, of course, if we, if we speak about uh, recent monuments um, in Belgium or elsewhere, I should also mention you know, the efforts that the civil society and the citizens themselves are making um, in constructing, in building these kind of spontaneous memorials. 
not only maybe, you know, for the terrorist attacks, not only in the remembrance of the people who are killed or people who have died recently, but also, you know, as a sort of a homage to the people who actually do not have a monument. And this is maybe an answer to your question, because a number of manifestations around Brussels um, actually uh, adhere to this kind of spontaneous democratic expression of memory as a sort of um, tool to uh, demand an official monument in a public space. And I think this is also quite um, uh, interesting uh, in modern times. Okay, thank you, Anna. We'll wait for new questions on the chat. Now I turn to Miguel. Um, I had a question for you, Miguel, but now I'm reading a question that came from the chat, which is very short and very specific. So maybe you can uh, answer it uh, quickly. Where is the head of Salazar Monument? Do you know it? <laughs> uh, I think no one knows. Uh, well, the image that I show you uh, is uh, from uh, 1975. Someone cut Salazar's head, but then in '78, someone put a, a bomb in the in the in the in that monument. So it was a totally destroyed monument, and the community made a fundraising to build another statue uh, uh, dedicated to Salazar, and this was a, a issue for some years. And in fact, the, that monument that I show you on the, the monument to the heroes of the overseas was also a way to stop that discussion that in fact, well, well, in fact was stopped in the, in, the, in the early 80s. But it was also a way to put a step in that, in that issue. And the question of uh, the memorialization of Salazar, in fact, in fact returned this year this year in the last in the last year and during this uh, in the last months in fact because uh, the municipality of santa combadão is organizing um, a space uh, in the in the old school where salazar uh, studied in the in the in the, in the village of vimieiro in the near uh, santa combadão to um, well to memorialize the figure of salazar and there was a huge, a huge contestation on that. In fact, some, some historians were involved in that proposal and uh, another historians like myself criticized that, that, that proposal because there was a discussion on, on the, whether this space will be a celebration of Salazar uh, or not. Uh, despite the, all the, all the discourse of the municipality that, the, the, that space will be a, a space to, to um, rem, uh, remember the, 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 the past, uh, but there is all, all this discussion about, uh, I mean, the, the, the question is, it is possible to remember a figure like Salazar in that particular memorial landscape, his house, his vineyards, is school. So how the space interfere in the way that uh, a particular figure is remembered, socially remembered. So uh, the question of the head of Salazar, in fact, is a huge question because it came from 75 until, until today. Thank you, Miguel. I have another more question for you. I'm translating from Spanish. So the question says, do you know that we can talk about the uh, Iberian model uh, of, mem of colonial memories um, from the, the, the lack of, um, of revisitation, uh, of addressing that public space and um, celebrating the um, for instance, the day of the of the Hispanidad. Mm. Well, uh, I An don't know. Iberian uh, yeah, model. It's, yeah, it's it's a huge question. Big, also, I, I I don't know quite well uh, how the, the the Spanish cases engage with the, their own colonial past. So well, I need well, I need, we need to compare it in the more in the more detailed manner. But in the Portuguese case, it is clearly a question of uh, 
Billig's definition of banal nationalism. So it is clearly something that is really embedded in the national identity, also because Portugal, Portugal had a really long uh, history of, of, of colonialism. And, uh, and, and we had a revolution, and this is interesting to compare with, with, the, with the Spanish case, because we had the our democracy came from a, a, a revolutionary rupture, differently from the Spanish case, but we had no, no gr critical reflection on that on our colonial past, despite the rupture uh, with, uh, with the dictatorship uh, was really tied with the colonial question because the, the captains that made the coup uh, were the captains that were defeated in the war. So this is a, a, a very interesting situation to see how some elements were um, of the past are uh, are really uh, important in the way that a, a country like Portugal frames its its narrative about about the democracy, but that others are really invisible. And the colonial past in the in the in Portuguese case, it's it's clearly uh, it's clearly that. Despite, and I think my my presentation, I think it's was focused on that. Despite from 2017 on, there is a, a movement. Of uh, denaturalize that that uh, mnemonic uh, framework. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. And now two questions for Alexandra and Celia. Maybe one of you can answer one, and the, the other one can answer the second one. I don't know. Uh, the first one says the decolonization of EU cultural policies seems more a question of actual implementation than theory compared to other major international actors like USA, China, Turkey. Is that right? This question. Uh, yeah, actually, in our presentation, we went through the, the policy documents, like the theory, you know, and we see that the theory kind of has, it has the principle, like the principle of people to people approach, uh, mutual dialogue, mutual respect. Um, then the question is how it is implemented and if these principles are, are translated into mainstreaming a decolonized approach in, in every single action that the EU, is in, the EU does in external cultural action, right? So I would say that definitely like it's, it's mostly a matter of, um, of implementation rather than of the theory. I don't know if Alexander wants to add something. Mm -hmm. And the second question, maybe for you, Alexandra, is mm -hmm. uh, local cultural and creative industries from third countries sometimes need and look for help and support from the EU in a, in a neo-colonial way? Um, maybe yes, uh, because they might benefit from some of the fundings that they receive. I, say, I would say that this is actually the role of the EU delegations to, to decolonize that way, actually, and to really um, hear what the local people need, what the local people really want to, to move further on in terms of cultural cooperation. I think there are um, good examples of this in terms of like big projects that are South-South cooperation projects, such as... Um, Procultura that promotes South-South exchanges between Brazil and other Lusophone countries, or triangular projects together with UNESCO, such as uh, Transcultura, based in Cuba and in Jamaica, for instance, that deals with um, Caribbean cultural heritage from a more regional perspective. So um, I think that that is actually the role of the EU delegations and, and the other partners to decolonize uh, and to kind of prevent our cultural cooperation projects from having this neocolonial approach. Thank you. We have another question for you, but it's very long. It's more a comment than a question. So you can read it on the chat because mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not able to, to, to summarize okay. it all. And the final question says something like, in this term, don't we risk to use intercultural policies 
as a as a too naive tool to make keep silencing voices while making think policymakers that something is improving while it's not? Mm, yeah, I actually kind of read that, that mm, question. I think that actually the basis of intercultural policies are those principles that um, Celia just mentioned about spirit of reciprocity, going from messaging to listening, um, co-creating together with everyone for, for, from a bottom-up approach. So I would say that intercultural relations should never miss hearing these minorities or, or this, um, I think the question referred to migrants uh, that, that the, the, this person referred to. So we, we shouldn't miss those. Thank you. And uh, from your presentation, I was thinking, um, so you mentioned several times the EU delegations in the third countries, and I know that they, they have means to to promote projects between the um, member states, the EU member states, and, and those countries where the, the delegations are based. Do, and I, I also uh, I've also read that both of you have been living in in in, in Cuba, in the island of Cuba. So maybe you know and can ex share with us any specific. Uh, or successful, hopefully, project promoting this mutual learning that you were mentioning from a decolonial perspective? Mm, yeah, well, I think it is key to understand that we, ha we are moving from a um, perspective of like showcasing our culture to a perspective of real exchange. Um, so actually, Maybe, Celia, you, you want to mention the example of the film festival, for instance, and I could mention a nice example from Senegal. Uh, yes, I can talk maybe about the European Film Festival because uh, this is an initiative that the EU has um, kind of mainstream among all the EU delegations, so like it's kind of a central activity to, of every EU delegation in the world. And it's true that um, this European Film Festival has was more portrayed as a showcasing of European cinema in outside of Europe. And it's interesting how at the same time that we have this kind of project, we also have other projects, other, other projects such as Las Cultura that Alexandra was mentioning, uh, which are more looking for this uh, cultural dialogue among parties and more equal to equal dialogue, which is something also very interesting that, that shows how maybe the paradigm is a little bit changing, which is Good. Yeah, the example I know from Senegal um, was in the Biennale of Contemporary Arts. I think that was 2016. Um, the European Union wanted to give funding to that Biennale, and it was actually framed that funding through the EUNIC, that they are the European Union International Institutions of Culture that were based in Senegal. So actually I think we, we did a really nice work at that time I was working there because um, we met with curators, with artists from Senegal and we kind of requested or asked what exactly, what were their needs or what would they want to see um, at the Biennale. And we actually came up with the design of a very interesting project on video mapping. So it was about um, developing capacities. We brought three experts on video mapping from Germany, uh, Spain, and France. And they all made capacity building trainings in which they developed capacities on specific video mapping um, techniques to five Senegalese people, Senegalese artists each. They would be showcasing the result of their work in three magnificent different facades from the, from the city. And then actually the project also managed to bring um, technical big equipments uh, that actually came from Europe, I think, um, and, and were then left in Dakar. So when these artists the, these three European artists left, uh, capacity building was reached, these artists knew about video mapping and, and it was the very first time uh, such a video, big video mapping project was shown in, in Dakar, in Senegal, in West Africa, actually. 
Well, thank you again to the four speakers. It has been really, really enlightening, all your presentations. And I hope that you contributed a bit to clarify this um, broad panorama that we we are addressing since a um, couple of decades, I think, uh, in, in not only in, in, in Europe, but in, in other parts of, of the world. Um, well, now I think I'm not missing any other questions uh, that came from the chat, so thank you. And now we have a 15 minutes break and we invite you to attend the, the second panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Hello, just a, a reminder, you, you can leave the room, but uh, it would be better if you could stay here with us uh, with your cameras and micros uh, in off. Okay, thank you very much. We have now, sorry, a few